wanted to correct one typo from the last lecture. It wasn't relevant really for the last le lecture, but it will be relevant for this one. So for the stable pairs space, there's the notion of descendants and there's two different symbols I introduced. There's the tau and that's given by this correspondence and you pull up cohomology and you then uh, multiply with K plus two, the churn character and push down. And the reason for that is you want this tau to have the same grading as the one in gromov witten theory. And that, that part was correct, but then in the notes, I just cut and paste to the churn character notation, which I said is better. And uh, it, I concentrated on the fact that I changed the sheaf to the complex, but of course I'm supposed to keep the K the same. There's in the notes yesterday, I had this, uh, this K to K plus two, and that makes no sense to have the churn character K here and K plus two here. So the, the actual correct thing is K and K. So I don't know if anyone noticed that, but anyway, they're corrected now. And as I said, it didn't matter for the last lecture because the last lecture was about formal properties, about rationality and things like that. It didn't really play a role what the actual specific meaning of that uh, index was, but it will now matter. So now I go to the last lecture. Uh-oh. No. This guy. Oh, I guess it's this one. Ah, okay. It's the last lecture, the fifth lecture. So here I have to tell you about the, the stable pairs virus R constraints. And in some sense, that's the whole goal of this, this series of lectures to get here. Um, and this is relatively new stuff. So most of the things in the lectures I've been speaking about, well, it's been back and forth, but a lot of it has been pretty old, but the actual work on the virus R constraints for stable pairs is relatively new, but it's a long project. So I want to explain what that is, how to get there and what the formulas are. And there's some surprises. So we start with X is a non-singular projected threefold with only PP cohomology. So this is, uh, we already on the gromov witten side, I had this restriction that to help us uh, avoid the sign rules and to help us avoid uh, the um, inclusion of the Hodge grading. So I keep that here. And the main example, and it, it's the place where actually the theorems are this is a toric threefold. And uh, now I want to write the virus R constraints. And by now, you should have some idea what these things are going to look like. Well, at least the shape. So the virus R constraints will take the form of universal relations among the descendant series. So that's what we discussed last time is when I put these descendant insertions in, I get a descendant series, which is a Q series. This is some sum over Q to the N, where N is the uh, holomorphic Euler characteristic of the sheaf F. So this is every one of these. In gromov witten theory, when we had this bracket, it was a number. But now on the stable pair side, these are every one of these are Q series. And in fact, um, by the conjectures or results, depending on where you're operating, these, this is actually not only just the Q series, it's actually a rational function. Every one of these is a rational function in Q. Yeah. in Q. So the virus R constraints were here are going to take the form of certain relations between rational functions in Q. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the algebraic form that the virus R constraints take on the sheaf side, on the um, stable pair side, is simpler than for gromov witten theory. But still, they require some, some terminology to explain. So the constraints, so before I write down the formulas and how to prove them in the cases we can prove them, uh, I would like to say some general things first. So the constraints are conjectural in almost all cases. So that's it. I mean, that's the where we are in the subject. And the main theorem, the main general theorem is that uh, the constraints hold whenever X is toric. And unfortunately not for every single constraint, what's called the stationary constraint. So I'll explain these two things during the lecture. Well, not toric. I'll explain what stationary constraints are, but that's the case where it's proven. And if you're interested in uh, the case where the cohomology is, uh, X has an interesting Hodge decomposition, then there's another paper. So this, 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 uh, this part was proven in a paper with uh, Miguel Moreira and then uh, Oblomkov, Okunkov, and myself in 2020. You can find it on my webpage or on the archive. And if you're interested in the case where X has more interesting Hodge decomposition, then there was a subsequent paper by uh, Moreira where he explains how to write down 
a proposal for the Beer Star constraints with the assumption that X is simply connected. So you get some Hodge decomposition there. And the last topic I'll talk today is about this more general, well, the Virasar constraints in general here, um, they're about these descendant integrals on stable pairs in the virtual class there. And you might, if you are find yourself a little distant from that world, there's a way to connect it to even more concrete algebraic geometry, which is since this is a theory about threefolds, you can dimension reduce it to a theory about surfaces. And when you do that, the Virasar constraints constrain uh, tautological integrals on the Hilbert scheme of points of uh, surfaces. And this was a topic of, uh, of um, well, part of the topic of Miguel's paper where he actually proves the result for all simply connected surfaces. So I will explain that a little bit in the end. But this is, a, if, you're in, if you are interested in, in uh, Hilbert schemes of points of surfaces, this gives some kind of new results about tautological integrals there that comes as just a corner of the stable pairs theory. So I will explain that also. Okay, so to, before I tell you how to write the uh, Virasara constraints, the formulas depend on some algebraic construction. So the first thing is where are we going to work? So we're going to work in an algebra of descendants of X. And this is a very simple algebra to think about. And, and silently, we've already been working in that algebra is that the generators are these uh, symbols with the churn characters. And the, the, the churn characters, and then they uh, inside the parentheses is any cohomology class of X. And so more or less, you take the free algebra, polynomial algebra on those symbols. But of course, there's some obvious relations. Like if you scale with a, a rational number inside the parentheses, that's the same as scaling outside. And also, if you add inside the parentheses, that's the same as adding outside. So as I said, this is the kind of uh, algebra of descendants that in some sense we've been silently working in anyway, and this is just making it explicit. Okay, so in order to define the various R constraints, we need three algebraic constructions uh, related to this algebra. And so the first is some derivations. So for every K greater than or equal to one, greater than or equal to minus one, sorry, here. For every K greater, greater than or equal to minus one, we define a derivation. And so it's a derivation, it's a Q derivation, so it annihilates Q and uh, it's from the algebra to itself. So all I have to do to define this is to give you the action on these generators. And that's given by a very simple formula. If I take this RK and uh, I feed it one of these uh, descendants, then what I get is some combinatorial factor. And then the turn index on the descendant is promoted by K. And this combinatorial factor depends on K, of course. And it depends also on the degree grading of this uh, cohomology class. And here it's always the complex degree. Since we have PP, uh, everybody's in even, and that's the complex grading. In the, if you want to consider uh, more general Hodge decompositions, then you have to pick a Hodge grading here. That's discussed in, in Miguel's paper. And if you're nervous about the minus one case, then of course minus one, there's no product that's a one. And then this doesn't promote the, the turn grading, but it demotes it. And then the convention is you can never have negative turn characters. So that's the definition of these derivations. They're pretty simple. Actually, they're pretty easy to think about. They just act as derivations and just have to remember to put the right combinatorial factor here. So that's the first one, that wasn't so bad. And then there's a certain kind of diagonal splitting. This is more notation. So the generators look like this, as we've discussed. So maybe a gamma, these are the generators of the algebra. But for notation, we want to introduce a different symbol where I put two churns together in gamma, and I just have to tell you what I mean by this. And it's some kind of coproduct with the diagonal. So I have to define this, this is the definition. And what you do is you just, you take a Kunath decomposition of the diagonal, which looks like this. There's some left people and some right people. And you just put it in the churn, the first one takes the left and the second one takes the right. So these are now generators. So this makes sense as an element in the uh, descendant algebra. So that's the second point. So we've already gotten two thirds of the way. So then there's some more notation. This notation is a little more complicated, but again, it's, there's really not much going on. So I, I want to define this crazy thing here. 
so we've already we've already kind of seen what this uh, churn A churn B of gamma is. That splits. Uh, that's the sum over the Kunath decomposition. But I want to now somehow weight this sum by various factors. So when I write this expression, what I mean is I sum over the Kunath decomposition with the left and right as I did before. But each term, I have some combinatorial prop, uh, combinatorial factor for the left and the right. And that depends on the degree of that term. And then finally, there's a sign. So this is just shorthand for that. OK? So you, you can look at the slides. It's not necessary to, to somehow absorb all the notation at once, but I'm just trying to give you some notation. So when I write the formula, it's small. It's complex degree, factorials with negative arguments are defined to vanish. And then the, the, the operator that we want with all this notation is just the simple element. Well, it's not so simple maybe, but it's an element. And the operator is multiplication by the element. And I tell you what this element is, TK. So, well, I just explain what this symbol means here, where I take this, uh, I take the Hodge decomposition and I, I, sorry, I take the Kunith decomposition diagonal with C1 and I split it here and then I weight it, weight the factors by, weight the summands by these factors and I sum. So anyway, this has now been completely defined. It's a particular element. It's just a single element of the, uh, this algebra, one, well, it depends on K. And then the sums, there's some rules about that. I wanted to have the a's greater than or equal to zero, a's and b's greater than or equal to zero. And then of course, this is the interesting part that the, what I'm submitting here are the first and second churn classes of the tangent bundle. Okay, so we have a, that was kind of fast. We have a quick review. There's the derivation and the derivation is very simple. It's just basically this k is bumping the churn index with some factor and then more complicated. So that was the rk. And then more complicated, if I do it backwards, is this element. We have to define this particular element. For every k, a particular element is the sentence algebra. And this notation defines this element. So it's first of all, I have to sum over a plus b equals k plus 2 and a plus b equals k. And then inside the sum is, are these symbols I've defined. So inside the sum is a second sum. And the second sum is uh, over these symbols, this Kunzi composition of the diagonal times this fellow that I submit to it. And then I weight every one of the Kunith uh, terms by some sign and some combinatorial factors. OK, so as I said, you can look at this if you're, if you're curious about that. But this is just a formula for a particular element. And once you, get, once you get used to this notation, it's not really that scary. And that's it, actually. That's all I have to tell you. And now the, the, the Virasara constraint operator, that's LK. It has this element. So whenever I write an element, that's an operator by multiplication by the element. That's a derivation. And then this is a composition, multiplication by this very particular element where that's the point class, I should say that. Point class. This is a particular multiplication by this particular element, then composed with a derivation, and then a factor. So that's the whole operator. And um, I would say that uh, this is a simpler uh, a simpler thing than that operator that I had defined in lecture two for the Virasara constraints and gramm in theory. I mean, it is true that this element has a certain complexity. I would say this der derivation is as simple as possible. And then after all here, we're just multiplication, multiplying by a simple descendant of a point and then uh, another derivation. So in some sense, if you want to look where's the complexity in this operator, perhaps it's here. That's the most complicated term. But anyway, it's not such a bad, uh, it's not so bad. And the Virasara conjecture in this form, I mean, this, this, this conjecture goes back many, many years to, roughly speaking, the origin of this conjecture was once we understood, this was, I mean, a long time ago when we were in Princeton, that once, once Andre and I understood that uh, there's this descendant correspondence and there, at the same time, the Virasara constraints held in gromov witten theory, then just, just by, just, just, it just must be that there are Virasara constraints on the on the descendant side. And we were at that, in those days, there were the ideal sheaves. Um, and we didn't have enough knowledge to actually do the transformation then. But still, we could just guess. So we could just, you could just, uh, once you know that there are these constraints, you should just try to guess them. And we did had guessed them in many cases. That's the beginning. But the, the formulation here uh, is the formulation from 2020. And it says that if X has only PP cohomology, you get to pick any curve class you want. 
you get to pick any element of this algebra. Then you su submit this element to that operator and you put the bracket and this is zero. So this is the descendant series and it's just always zero. So it's some kind of miraculous uh, conspiracy among descendant series for uh, three folds, stable pair descendant series. They conspire in this way to always give you zero. And uh, that's, this is easy to play with. So, well, I mean, a certain part of it's easy. For example, X equals P3. So I can pick whatever D I want. Of course, if I pick some D that has the wrong dimension and everything, then this thing's identically zero. So you don't want to pick a stupid D. But if you pick a, if you pick a D that's interesting, so the dimension constraint satisfied. So for example, in this example for uh, X equals P3, I pick this D, I pick L1. I get to pick also which Virasaro operator. I want to pick some L1. And I take this, this D equal this particular choice. Uh, and then I apply L1 to D and that's just mechanical because I've just given you the specific rules. So it's some derivations, some multiplications. And if you follow those rules, you'll find that uh, it's this operator applied to D. And then you can just do it. And this is the left-hand side is what you get. The left-hand side is this uh, LKD inside brackets. I've written it into three terms because there's three terms here. And what this, what this uh, conjecture says is that if I take the descendant series for these three, with these, with these combinatorial factors that just sum to zero. And this is about lines in P3. So it doesn't, it's not so hard to check this by hand. And it turns out that for, for these line invariants that actually this series is not irrational. Well, it is a rational function, but in fact, it's a polynomial. And it's a polynomial with three terms in each one of these. It's, it's a very simple geometry, lines in P3. And uh, each one of these numbers can be checked because it's each one of these numbers is some integral on some stable pairs space. And you can just, well, these numbers, you check them and you do this uh, precisely this common Troy weights and you get zero. It's, uh, um, it works perfectly in this case. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Is it known to be false if X isn't dimension three? I mean, uh, I think that for the most part, so I, about dimension two, I told you that I'm gonna make some comments and uh, a version of this is just exactly true for dimension two. Dimension one, I haven't thought about, but dimension four, it's not clear what it means. That, uh, you know, dimension four, it's not so clear what, because we, there's some virtual class here. I mean, you could hope for, maybe the question you're asking, if I can interpret it, is that maybe you could, you could try to ask whether this whole thing is just zero cohomologically. And that stuff is not going to be true, although I'm not prepared here to give you an example of that. But then the Groma Witten side, it's not the case that, um, yeah, I mean, usually it's not the case that they vanish without the virtual class. And if you have uh, in dimension four, we don't have a virtual class in general, so it's not clear what it means. I don't know if that's an answer. But in dimension two, it's definitely true and interesting. And I will mention that at the end. Okay, so that's the, that's the conjectural part and that's the formulation. And as I said, this is re it's really kind of mechanical and, and not at all hard to uh, wrap your head around. You just take your any X. And as I said, for, for the formulation I'm picking here, you should have PP cohomology. Then there are these operators on this descendant algebra. And they, as I said, they're, they're it's pretty easy to understand them. And then once, once, that, once you have that somehow laid, loaded into your brain, then this uh, conjecture starts giving you relations among the, dis, the, the different descendant series. And it gives you lots of them. And they're non-trivial. We have one fun whole question about this example, I think. The question is, how is this sum zero? I guess somebody actually <laughs> tried to compute it and they didn't get zero. Well, I don't know. It's like you took here minus three plus one plus two, that's zero. Six minus 10 plus four, that's zero. Minus three plus one plus two is zero. L looks pretty zero to me. I think uh, her last exponent two should be a three. Ah, sorry. That's a good point. <laughs> now it's zero. Yeah, maybe that br brings down the whole conjecture. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, that these are each one of, in this line case, you get one number for the first three exponents. Thanks, I'll fix that on the slides. Okay, so um, yeah, as I, and 
I, I will say that also in Miguel, so you, I think a, maybe a, another question you might think is that what happens when it's not PP So when it is PP cohomology, the toric cases, one can do a bunch of examples like this. Of course, as the degrees and things get harder, then, then it becomes harder to compute these. And uh, Alexei has some software, Alexei Oblomkov has some software, but of course the software doesn't go to infinity. It eventually, uh, the computer breaks eventually. But for the toric cases, you can check a lot. So in the sense of confidence, we're pretty confident in the toric case, there's a lot of checks. Besides, there's a theorem, which I'm gonna explain in a second. But in the case where it has interesting Hodge decomposition, then the examples are much harder to check because there's not so many good tools. And uh, Miguel Moreira has done uh, some basic checks for the, the uh, cubic threefold, which has some, you know, some interesting Hodge decomposition in the middle, and it passed those checks in that formula. But in, also in the, on the gromov witten side, the number of cases where the Avirasara constra constraints are proven where there is some interesting Hodge decomposition is basically just for curves. I mean, there's some kind of cases, some trivial cases, but the interesting cases are just for curves because it turns out uh, on both sides, it's pretty hard to compute for such varieties because they don't have this localization. And there's when, for two reasons, particularly basically is that it means that the variety does not have some kind of good torus action. Well, certainly not a torus action with isolated fixed points. So that's one thing, that's one tool that you can't use immediately, or at least off the shelf. And the second is that another tool that one likes to use is degeneration, they can break the variety. And typically what happens is if the variety has some interesting hot structure, you, can't, you can often break it, but uh, there'll be some vanishing cycles and you'll lose some of that cohomology and then you'll, you'll lose, it'll just run away from you in the degeneration. The degeneration will tell you about some stuff, but it won't, it'll, it won't tell you about the uh, cycles you've lost in the degeneration. Okay, so this was a, an aside. So what's the theorem? The theorem from in our paper last year says that uh, if X is toric, that's a, and of course I'm always in, assuming non-singular projective, then these Virasara constraints hold in all for all K, for all X toric, for all curve classes, but the only restriction is that the D you submit must be stationary. And what that means is defined here is it's the subalgebra defined by all descendants um, so there's no restriction on the uh, on the churn index, but there's only one restriction on the cohomology index, and that's its degree has to be greater than zero. So what does this mean? It just means that this 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 thing can't be one can't be the identity class. Can't be the identity class. So this says that if if as your the red D that you submit, as long as you don't involve uh, descendants don't involve anything like descendants of the identity class, then it's fine, then it's proven. Of course, we think it's true also for the descendants of the identity class and you can check it by hand. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the descendants of the identity class, it's just that our proof doesn't capture them. Okay, but this is a lot of cases and basically it's almost all of them, it's just you just can't put descendants of the identity class, which is a shame and I'll explain why that, uh, that, that, that one runs away from us. Okay, so there are any questions about this theorem? In particular, this theorem does cover this example, meaning that, uh, yeah, independent of this kind of blue check, this thing is uh, covered by the theorem. Shouldn't identity be the simplest case in a sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, it, is a, um, it is a reasonable philosophical position that identity is the simplest case, but it's also equally defensible that identity is the most complicated case. And I'll make the second argument. And that is that uh, if you look at this threefold, it's some you know big space, you know Maria, it's like Russia, you know, <laughs> and the point can go anywhere it wants. Uh, now, if I give it a cycle, then it has to live in a smaller place, so that somehow its its movement is constrained. If I put the identity, uh, if I put the identity condition, then it can move anywhere it wants. And from this point of view, I've given it the most freedom. And then, and, and from the point of view of controlling it, it's the least control. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you accept that argument, but that's, uh, that's actually some sense the relevant one here. So it, it, you know, this, this notion stationary uh, comes from the study of P1. It's like an old word that came from how we used to describe, Andre and I described the study of P1. And P1 only has two classes. It's the identity class, and the point class. 
And if you remember in the earlier lectures, I gave you some specific rule about how to deal with descendants of the point class, how to relate them to Hurwitz theory. Uh, and, and it is the case that, I mean, if you're, if you're faced with a calculating and Gromov Witten invariant of P1, you could have some descendants of identity and descendants of the point. The point ones are the easier ones to deal with. And we know how to deal with everything now, but there is some kind of uh, uh, staging of complexity in the points of the easier one and the descendants of identity, the harder one. And it's precisely because that, I, that descendant of identity, the point gets to move wherever it wants. If you take a descendant of a point, that the marked point has to be fixed to that point and you control that, that control it a lot. In particular, if you take a degeneration, you can tell it where to go, et cetera. Okay, I think I've said enough, but it's certainly true that Often one feels that the identity is the easiest cohomology class, but happens here, it's the hardest. Okay, is that enough? So um, how this proof works for the, uh, for this statement is it's kind of three steps. And so the first step is that, so we start with X is a toric threefold. And the first step I already told you is that the gromov witten virus R constraints hold. So this is because every torque threefold is semi-simple and uh, that's a result of Irritani, I think. And every, um, every semi-simple cohomological field theory, uh, well, though there's a, you have to use the classification for semi-simple cohomological field theory is given tall Telemann classification and then Telemann proves that the gromov witten uh, Virasara constraints hold. Okay, so that's the starting point. So then the issue is that if we believe they're equivalent, we have to somehow get these various are the gromov witten constraints to the stable pairs. And how is that gonna be done? So you need to have a gromov witten pairs descendant correspondence. This has a promotion of this gromov witten DT correspondence that I explained in the previous lecture. So you have to have a full promotion of that. And this has taken really a long time to develop. I would say maybe 15 years or something like that. Because you need to first prove this thing exists. Well, for, first you imagine its form, and you have to prove it exists. And in, in some papers with Aaron Pixton starting around 2012, we proved we, we, well, we conjectured a particular form, we proved that form holds for tor in the toric case, but we didn't compute the coefficients of that form of the correspondence. And then um, returning to the actual problem of computing the coefficients, there was the, the, a, uh, some progress was made in 2019 with uh, Alexei and, um, Andre. And the idea for that was that by then we know there exists, uh, we know the form, and we know that it's true, that this abstract correspondence is true for uh, toric varieties. So we need just to need to compute the coefficients. And to compute the coefficients, uh, if you're clever enough, you can just, you can learn a lot by doing this example, this old example, P1 with two, the total space of two line bundles on P1. Actually, they're actually the trivial line bundle, the trivial. You take P1 cross C2, that's a pretty simple thing. Uh, and you have to compute it completely in some sense on the gromov witten side and also on the stable pair side. Uh, and we know how to do those things very well, but you need to keep track of some equivariant aspect of this. turns out to do these things very well, in some sense, you have to take opposite weights here. And this opposite weights looks like a drastic thing, but roughly speaking, you do the calculation, the descendant calculation with opposite weights on the gromov witten side and on the stable pair side. And what happens on the gromov witten side is you get that entire theory that I discussed, which is the gromov witten theory of P1 that I had solved with Andre years before that all those formulas go in. Actually on the stable pair side, it's a little bit easier. So anyway, you have these three, you have these three things, the, the general form of the transformation that's proven, but the coefficients aren't known, the calculation of this on the gromov witten side and the calculation of this on the stable pair side. And this gives you some mathematical constraints for that, what that uh, correspondence is. And it turns out that the outcome of that is we can calculate that correspondence, except we lose control of the descendants of one, that the descendants of one somehow sneak out of this and they, in some sense, sneak out because of this t, t, t minus t local um, specialization. So that's some kind of summary. If you can, if you want, you can read uh, the discussions in the papers. But roughly speaking, that's the development. First, you have to prove that there exists a correspondence with undetermined coefficients, but nevertheless, that exists. 
And then the second thing is you have to compute it. And the computing uses all sorts of tricks. I mean, some years of tricks, but the, the outcome is that uh, the descendants of one escape those tricks. So that's only the second part. Then there's, a, then there's something that one has to do, which is a kind of huge thing in some sense, algebraically, is that there's some crazy correspondence, which I'm going to show you the formulas for it. Uh, then you have to take the Virasara constraints, which have their own complexity, and then you have to transform them by this correspondence. Then you get something that you know is true, and then you hope it's this one. We had conjectured this form long before we'd done these calculations from just data. You have to hope that you're going to end up on this. So you have to go through this, this path, and then you have to hope you're going to end up exactly here. And that's exa that's, that is what happens, but the calculations are kind of long, and I, I will show you. I'll show you the complexity that happens. I mean, somehow, as I, I was trying to say, is that these Virasara constraints on the, on the sheaf side are uh, algebraically simpler. These formulas are kind of nice and simple. On the other hand, on the gromov witten side is somehow complicated, and the correspondence is very complicated. So somehow the correspondence undoes uh, some of the complexity of the way the, the uh, Virasara constraints are born in gromov witten theory. And that's why this derivation is rather complicated. I want to show you some of the formulas. I'm going to show you some formulas here. But, but maybe before I do that, I wanted to make some kind of other point, which is for this whole subject, this proof is slightly backwards. So yeah, this is another point I should have made earlier, is that many people who work on these things would view that the geometry of the stable pairs to be simpler than gromov witten theory. And in fact, that's the um, one of the nice facts about this correspondence that there's various things in, in stable pairs theory that one likes to study, and you can prove, and then you can move them back to gromov witten theory. And 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 many results, this is uh, this idea is used. So one could hope that the descendant behavior and stable pairs is simpler than gromov witten theory, and actually the form of the Virasara constraints confirms that belief. And so, given that, it's a little bit strange that the proof has to go through gromov witten theory. And so that's, uh, I would say that I would like to run the whole argument the other direction, to have some geometric reason for the, descendant, the, the descendants to respect the virus R constraints on the, on the stable pair side, and then use that rather to prove the gromov witten invariance. But I don't know how to do that at the moment. All the arrows are pointing down. I want the arrows to turn the arrows around, but I'm not able to. So that's the main challenge here. Prove the virus R constraints or stable pairs directly using the geometry of the modular space of stable pairs. And this is a problem that you can just, there's something, there's some relief when you can think about this problem. Especially, I think that if you're, if you haven't uh, gone through the past 20 years, there's some relief when I put the form in this form because you can just start here. You don't have to listen to the first five lectures. You just start with this constraint operator and think about stable pairs. The first four lectures, sorry. But I don't know how to do it. A couple of questions, Raul. Yeah. Um, one of them is, is there some integrable hierarchy around? So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, you know, it, it is the case that if you look at like the Hilbert scheme of points, there's all sorts of uh, algebraic structures that are there. And I, I don't know how to lift, you know, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking also, but well, maybe, maybe you're asking, does this satisfy the Virasara bracket? And it, it's close to doing that. That's a separate topic. These constraints are very close to satisfying the Virasara back. You have to correct them slightly because of the, the correspondences don't quite respect that. I don't know if that's what your question. Another question is that like the Hilbert scheme of points has all sorts of uh, algebraic structure on the full cohomology. And one could hope maybe that these Virasara constraints for stable pairs would be some shadow of some parallel algebraic structure on the cohomology of stable pairs. And there's some difficulties to go down that path, although it, it seems like a, a, an interesting line of thought. And the one of the difficulties is that stable pairs as an actual physical space, are, they're kind of terrible. It's only the virtual class that's good. And it's not, it's not the case that, that I know how to promote that virtual class to a whole cohomology theory. This is the direction of refined invariance. And there are ways to do that when X is Kalabi Yau, that's precisely not the case we're studying here. Other than this, I don't know, but it's a good question, I think. And the other uh, question, I think it has 
or to do with the argument that you just gave us the proof. Is there any hope to instead transfer the argument proving the Vera sort of constraints using semi simplicity and given that formalism directly to the stable pair side? Sorry, I, somehow you ha you're, you're you're speaking too softly. I heard Sorry, some words, but not all of them. The question is is in the Q and A. So. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe I can try. Yeah. I can't read the Q and A now unless I stop my screen share. I'm telling Please you, my Zoom is not optimal. So, I'll speak louder. Can you transfer the argument proving the Virasoro constraints uh, using semi simplicity and the given? Ah, uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. No, we don't know how to do that. That's actually a good question, and the. the you know, I say that the mod, you know, I, I, so there's a way in which the Grimaud Witten theory is, uh, has extra structure, which is the genus. And the semi simplicity is about, uh, that's about genus zero, and then having genus zero control higher genus uh, using classification. That's kind of a structure that's in Grimaud Witten theory. Uh, in other words, like when you think about Grimaud-Witten theory, you start the simplest, that's genus zero, and then you start moving up higher, genus one, genus two. What happens with stable pairs or the sheaf theory is they're not like that. There isn't some kind of, um, you know, I don't know how to formulate a classification theorem. I don't know how to, uh, and Grimaud-Witten theory sits over the moduli space of curves. The moduli space of curves is something that's independent of the target. You can think about, you can try to think about things like this and it's profitable to prove, and, it, and it's used to prove some things. But if you take a, a target X and you take some moduli space of sheaves on X, uh, like in, in our case, the stable pairs, that's a sheaf with a section. Um, what do you want? What, for, what structure do you want to, for, first of all, what's the simplest one? There's no sense in which there's a simplest one. It's not like there's a genus zero, genus one. They all come at you at once. There is the Euler characteristic index but you don't really even know where that starts. It starts somewhere negative. Uh, and I think you could make a case that the lowest one is the simplest one, but there's no, the lowest one depends on beta. It's not so clear what, it's, it's not uniform like in the curves with this genus zero. That's the, the first thing. The second thing is uh, the modular space of maps, maps to the modular space of curves. And that's somehow a crucial part of the idea of this classification that's used there. And it is an interesting thing to think about that kind of idea for stable pairs. If you take stable pairs, it's a sheaf and a section. So what could I do? What structure could I forget? Well, I could forget the section. So stable pairs in some sense should map to, to sheaves. And that's a, that's a very promise. I mean, that's a very profitable line. Of course, it becomes more delicate immediately because then what's, the, what's that space of sheaves? Well, maybe you take an art and stack of sheaves or maybe you have to impose some stability conditions. But this is, a, this is a useful line to think about stable pairs mapping to just moduli space of sheaves. And that's, that's, I mean, that's used, for example, in this to prove that Q goes to one over Q invariances in the Klabiao case. That's the map that's available, but that map has a very different flavor than the map from MG, from moduli space of stable maps to moduli space of curves. It's just a much, much it's a, for example, it still depends on X. So I, I don't know how to do how that what that question is asking, which is the, I, which I interpret as somehow finding all the parallel structures that are used on the moduli of curve side to find those structures on the sheaf side and then use the same argument. I don't know how to do that. Okay, that was a long answer. But anyway, I regard this of for this like lecture series, the main challenge is to prove the various constraints for stable pairs directly using the geometry of stable pairs. And I, I tried to present this as a, a, a appealing path to think about, because as I said, if you're entering the subject for the first time, you can work on this problem without studying all of that history in, of Grimaud Witten theory. Sub challenge is to control the sentence of one. I think that if, you, and then the advantage for this is that if one can find some kind of geometric argument where it's true, then maybe that geometric argument won't use anything. Well, maybe we'll be able to prove the various constraints in all cases, not just the semi-simple ones. That's the, the practical hope. Okay, so then I want to say a little bit about this correspondence. And this, this is going to hurt a little bit. So, you know, in fact, it hurts so much, I didn't want to write the, all the formulas myself because they were already written. And it, it's, it took, actually took a long time to get these things correct. So I, this gromov witten descendant correspondence in the form we use is a rule. It's just an explicit rule by explicit formulas. And that rule, is going to tell you how. So can you see this or should I make it bigger? Is that better? Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's a rule that, so this is the stable pair side. And this is the gromov witten side. And in the, in the, oh, sorry, oh, I don't know what happened there. I got lost. Oh, yeah. So in the original uh, gromov witten dt correspondence, what we had roughly speaking was that if you just take no descendants because it's Kalabiao on the stable pair side, and that's just the same as the series with no descendants on the gromov witten side. And then the, all you have to do is change the u here, sorry, the Q here and the U here, and that's given by this change of variables. That's the old rule. It's a simple, you can't, uh, you can't make any rule simpler than that. It's just one goes to one in our current language. But now we have to find a rule, this correspondence says that if we start with say an arbitrary descendant on the uh, stable pair side, and these are our churn descendants it's the same notation, except there's a tilde. And what is this tilde? It's just the old ones shifted by a little bit it turns out that the formula is a little bit better there. It's not anything to worry about. But anyway, the, we have to find a rule where if you give me some uh, descendant polynomial, then I have to use my rule to turn it into some descendant polynomial on the gromov witten side. And after that, it has to satisfy the correspondence. So it's some specific rule to turn it to this side. And then when I apply the brackets, I should get the same series after this uh, uh, change of variables. There's some auxiliary Q and U coefficients. But that's the, uh, that's the challenge to find some kind of universal rule that transform descendants on the stable pair side to descendants on the gromov witten side. And, and as I said, there has been a lot of thought about that. And MNOP2 was the first ideas about the structure of the such a rule, the existence and structure of this rule. And my papers with Pixton, we explain a particular uh, form, this universal form this rule takes. We conjecture that that form uh, holds for all three folds and we prove it in the toric case. And then the last step is to actually calculate specifically the coefficients of that form. So, so that's the goal and that's what's needed to transform. Because once you have this rule, you're really in good shape because uh, exactly this rule tells you if you want to compute stable pairs descendants and you know how to compute gromov witten invariance, this rule will just solve your problem. It just tells you how to do it. So once you have this rule, then you can, prob you can take knowledge about the gromov witten stable pairs, I mean, the gromov witten descendants and move them to stable pairs. And the knowledge you want it to, to move in this direction are the Virasara constraints in gromov witten theory. Okay, so what is, the, what is the nature of this rule? And as I said, the formulas, they look um, complicated, but you know, after thinking about them for a long time, they could be worse, let's put it this way. So these are the descendants in gromov witten theory. And the first idea is you should switch to a different basis. And this is an old idea. And I think these were first appeared in papers of Ezra Getzler. So sometimes this is called Getzler's renormalization, but there's some specific change and it's given by what I circled in red here. It says that if you want to know these taus, I explain in these formulas, they explain how to write them in terms of these A descendants. So it's not such a big deal and these formulas aren't too bad. Like these are you know some summations with some combinatorial factors. And in some sense, the reason for this is that it was, it, it was known, that's why Ezra introduced them. The gromov witten theory of curves is best uh, written in terms of these A operators. And as I explained in the overview that at some point we're gonna interact with the gromov witten theory of curves to, to nail the coefficients of the descendant correspondence. So this is the first idea. Then the second idea is that, okay, I have to find this rule. If I take this rule, it takes a stationary descendant on the, on the pair side and moves it to the gromov witten side. And that rule is this uh, mathfrak C dot. I don't know how to pronounce that. But uh, this, this uh, C dot rule, that's what we're going to define. And the way to define this is first you, um, you sum over all ways of interacting. Actually in the MNOP2, we have this kind of uh, discussion of this rule is in terms of chemistry is where we have these, uh, these churn characters are little particles and they interact with each other. And so here you have to sum over all interactions. And this, uh, the open uh, dot is the kind of connected interaction. And that's given by three explicit formulas where you have one interaction, that's a self-interaction, two churn characters can interact, or three can interact. Why is it only of these three? Because these are, um, I said, they're, they're stationary. So they're, this cohomology grading has to be, it cannot be, it's not in H0. It has to be in H2, H4, or H6. And one of the, one of the 
nice features about these interactions is they can only, these interactions are only supported where the actual cohomology classes interact non-zero. This is another reason for, another answer to Maria's question is if I, if I want to put in identity class, then there's an infinite many, I have to consider infinitely many chains of these because you can have, the, the cohomology class can always keep interacting. So it's actually, from this point of view, dramatically easier to think about to avoid this cohomology class because once I have uh, the cohomology insertions being stationary, at most three of them can interact. So I only have to solve for the correspondence for these three things. And, and here are the explicit formulas. I said, it takes a lot of work and it takes an incredible amount of uh, attention to get these formulas correct. And, and I would say it took years, maybe a decade or something like that. I mean, we weren't working on it all the time, but yeah, I would say that's a fair statement, roughly speaking. So this tells you how to take these churn characters and move them to this Getzler uh, notation for the descendants. And, and this previous one tells you how to move the Getzler to the taus. And the outcome of that is a theorem. And it says that that theorem says that in this toric case, and we conjecture in general, but in the toric case, uh, that's the formula for the correspondence. And if you've seen, if you're coming to this the first time, you think, okay, that's crazy. It's going to, these formulas are terrible. They're not going to be useful for anything. Uh, and I think that's a fair, uh, fair first view of these formulas that they, they look terrible and they're not useful for anything. But in fact, when you really get into the subject, they're not so bad actually. And they are useful. And to give, to prove that they're useful, it's the last step here in this argument. In some sense, the, these formulas prove themselves to be useful because you can complete this last step. Using these formulas, you can exactly, you can transfer the, the virus R constraints from Gromov-Witten theory, which have their own complexity to the virus R constraints I wrote for stable pairs. And as I said, part of that, when you, when you look at that in this paper, so that, that's, this transfer is done in this paper from last year. And if you look at that paper, it, it, there's a lot of, kind of long calculations, which take these formulas, basically you take, you have to take the long formulas for the virus R constraints of gromov witten theory, and you have to crash them against these formulas for the transfer. And the inescapable feeling doing that is that to somehow this correspondence is undoing the complex, some complexity in the uh, original gromov witten virus R constraints. But that's kind of a, a, a pretty serious algebraic calculation. Which, uh, which succeeded after some years also. So that, that's the end of the proof of the theorem. And I wanted to say that, so that's, uh, that's the end of the proof of the theorem. And that's almost what, the last thing I want to say, but I do want to say one more thing, which is about the Hilbert scheme of points. And that's in uh, Miguel's paper. So, I have a question, which I think yeah. is about what happened before. So, how do virasoro constraints pass through cutting and gluing with respect to a threefold? Oh, that's a that's an excellent question, um, and the sad answer is that we don't really know very well. And actually, the 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 final way I think the fundamental way to ask that question, let us say in gromov witten theory, is that if you take a a, a a smooth variety like I said, that gives a uh, usual gromov witten theory, and there's virasoro constraints for that usual gromov witten theory. But over the years, has developed also a log gromov witten theory. And the simplest one is if you take some variety respect to some divisor, there's a log relative gromov witten theory. Now it's called log gromov witten theory. And log gromov witten theory, you can take more complicated uh, targets. Uh, and the, I think the fundamental way to ask question is that, is there a way to state the virus R con constraints in log gromov witten theory? And the answer is that we don't know. But there's two pieces of evidence. The first is in the proof that Andrei Okunkov and I did for the curve case. That's dimension one. A crucial step is to formulate the gromov witten invariants for log curves, not just, so not just curves, but curves with, uh, well, or log structures at one point. Uh, that was a crucial step and we formulated and it's part of the proof. You have to, I mean, what's one of the things we use? So the answer is yes in dimension one and it's crucial. In higher dimension, we don't know how to do it. All there's been some effort uh, more recently, there's been some ideas about using uh, negative negative tangency conditions. So various people have been working on this, Hong Lu Fan and Long Ting Wu. Uh, 
uh, to use uh, negative uh, tendency conditions to try to write Virasar constraints. There's been some, I think, some success in Gina zero. I don't know, that, that, but, but the answer is that we don't know how to do this. I, I don't know how to do this. There's been some effort. It would be, it would be great if someone wrote down Virasar constraints for an arbitrary log target. I think that would help in, in the proofs, help in the idea of proving it. In some sense, that's one of the reasons why there's not so many cases outside the Torah cases. Okay. And I, and the, and these parallel the, the parallel uh, statements on the um, stable pair side. I mean, I haven't really discussed the stable pairs theory, stable pairs relative to a, a divisor. This is actually one of my favorite parts of the whole the whole subject: three folds relative to a divisor. And there's some kind of miracle that happens where the, the, the Grimov Witten DT correspondence is uh, sort of can be formulated in this law in this log context. So the this, the classical example is a, a, a threefold relative to a smooth divisor, and there's been that's been studied a lot. And one of the really interesting things there is that the boundary conditions on the Grimov Witten side, if you're familiar with relative Grimov Witten theory, transfer themselves to these incidence conditions. On the Hilbert scheme, that's kind of what the Hilbert scheme of points of that surface. That's what receives the boundary conditions in stable pairs, and it precisely goes to the Nakajima basis there. And more recently, in the past year, there's a paper by Devesh Malik and Dhruv Ranganathan, which uh, um, defines this log stable pairs ideal sheaf theory for a arbitrary log, log target, or maybe there's some conditions, but more or less a log target. And, and there also you can lift the, lift the gromov witten DT correspondence. So if you go to these uh, degenerations, it's, there, sh there should be no essential problem with the gromov witten DT correspondence. That survives everything. The difficulty is the Virasar constraints. We don't know how to formulate them. Okay, so that was another long answer to the question. I hope that uh, conveyed some information. So the last topic I, I said I want to talk about is this Hilbert scheme of points of a surface. And one of the reasons is that there's, a, there's something very concrete and nice here that comes. And the other is it somehow brings this uh, stable pairs uh, subject to earth in some way, in the sense that if, if people have not thought about stable pairs, they might think about some in the abstract space you might not bump into. But in fact, um, in one, one corner of the theory is the very familiar Hilbert scheme of points of a surface. And how that works is not surprising. If I have a threefold, if my threefold X is of the form S, that's my simply connected non single projective surface cross P1, then the result. Uh, so if I'm interested in the surface, I can make this threefold, which is just crossing it with a P1. And then moreover, I look at the curve class, which is just the vertical curve class, just the P1. And I look at N times that. So it looks like N. The, curve, the curves look like this, the sheaves look like that. Or they could be all clustered together. Then the first geometric fact is the stable pair space for this threefold and for exactly this curve class is as a scheme, just the Hilbert scheme of endpoints of S. So I leave that to you to check. There's not really much there to check. And then something else which is nice is the virtual class of this uh, stable pair space is just the usual fundamental class of this, which is well known to be smooth of dimension 2n. So that's, so not only is the, the scheme, the Hilbert scheme, but the uh, virtual class, it's not some wild class on the Hilbert scheme, but it's the usual fundamental class. So this means that uh, these tautological integrals over the Hilbert scheme are a corner. They're just included as a certain corner of the stable pairs theory. And so then it makes sense to say that if we know descend, if we can constrain the descendants by these Virasar constraints, and they should also say something about the Hilbert scheme of endpoints. And this is exactly the, the path that uh, Miguel takes in that paper. That's this is the paper. Uh, Virasar conjecture for stable pairs, descendant theory of simply connected threefold. So he proposes uh, constraints for simply connected threefolds, which then have to do with some of the Hodge grading. And then he specializes them for surfaces in the way that I've suggested. 
and you get these constraints for surfaces. But moreover, he then he proves them for surfaces. And the way you can, why he can prove it for surfaces uh, with this non-trivial Hodge grading is because we know how to prove it for toric surfaces by our toric results. And then you can use some universal properties of the Hilbert scheme to show that that actually proves it for all surfaces. So here, this is also evidence that the Virasar constraints for three folds are right, the ones that he wrote with Hodge decomposition. It gives some kind of confirmation of that. Anyway, so I wanted to write some, some things about this. So what is a descent of the Hilbert scheme? So this is this, so this you can now just forget about stable pairs. What is the Hilbert scheme? The Hilbert scheme is some, some space of points, subschemes of endpoints of S. And then there's the product and the universal object there is the universal subscheme. And what's a descendant? Here in this language, you take churn character. Well, you take a cohomology class on S, you bring it back to the product, then you multiply a churn character of this uh, universal subscheme. That's the this universal subscheme has some very, it's not smooth, but it has some finite resolution, and you can take its churn, its churn characters are well defined. And then, as, as I said, we always shift it by the trivial one. It doesn't matter much, but it's a little bit nicer. And then you push it down, and that gives you some tautological class on the Hilbert scheme. It's some, it's some churn class of this uh, universal subscheme. It's a slightly non trivial thing because this, uh, this universal subscheme is singular. So that's the, that's the descendant act, acting in the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme. And what does the, what is um, the theorem? The theorem says that if you take a simply connected uh, surface and you put in any, some, you, you put in some monomial, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous way I wrote it, I put anybody in the descendant algebra, but you put in some monomial, and then there's an operator that acts on it. And once I finish this action, then I integrate every term, I should get zero. And every term is a descendant integral. So the only question is, what is this operator? And you get this operator by actually just going up to this, you take X cross P1 and you take this curve class and then you go take the operator that we know there. Since the virtual classes are doing the things you want, this will give you. So what is the, what is the formula for this operator? So there's gonna be the T and R, and these are very similar to the ones we had for three folds. I don't, I don't rewrite them now. You can look in Miguel's paper. And then there's one more, which takes a slightly different form. So I, I thought I'd just write that last one. SK, to define SK, you take this derivation on the algebra and here's the descendant algebra with generators for the surface. And it's, we have a slightly different thing here. We have this descendant operator with a cohomology class and there we bump and we also multiply the cohomology class. And this S operator then, uh, I just wanted to give one show, show you one place where the, the Hodge decomposition matters. This S operator is uh, this derivation now, but with a, with a cohomology class who's gonna bump and then the churn character here. And the sum runs over all terms of the decomposition of the diagonal, but where the left-hand one only has zero in the Hodge uh, on the left side in the Hodge decomposition. So if it's simply connected, there's not many choices. It could be zero, zero, or it could be zero, two. But this is, a, this is roughly speaking how these things look. They look very similar to the threefold one, except there's some dimension reduction. So some twos turn to threes when you go through this. And then Miguel also puts the Hodge weights. So the Hodge, the Hodge weights will go through all of these and they come in in this way somehow. In order to find to find these operators, you need to know something about the Hodge decomposition. Okay, but then that's extremely explicit. Moreover, this is a theorem, and it gives in practice what it does is you give this the surface, you take these uh, descendant uh, operators, and it gives you some non-trivial relations after integration there, and they're true. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here. So it's, yeah, it's too bad that I didn't come to Paris or, or, or to, to Bureau. It would have been nice to meet people, especially students I've not met before. So if you've been to all these lectures, I invite you if you're in Zurich to knock on my office door. And then uh, after a short exam, I can give, we can go to coffee or something like that. Short exam on the course material. And uh, so here it's been raining all week and here's the view, the Zurich view.
on a kind of stormy day and sunset, and that's it. That's the end. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you knew about the Virasoro operator for PT site before the correspondence. Uh, could you explain how you could guess before? Oh, you mean before you're saying we knew? Oh, yeah, how we guess. So, yeah, the, I know exactly how we guess that uh, Andre, this was a really long time ago, maybe 2005, something like that. Andre had written a small box counting program for DT. And uh, then you, you see this answer is very simple. There's only one thing complicated in it. Oh, I'm sorry, I've, I stopped share. It doesn't matter. So I, we I guess for P3, and I just was just we just wrote down the terms that we thought would could occur, and you leave you put them with undetermined coefficients, and then you start generating data, and you see whether I mean you if there's going to be one, then you can solve for it because the system is massively overdetermined. If there's not going to be one, then you're just then you're just going to be wasting your time. But, but it turns out we found very quickly we found L1, and once you find one, you can start taking the bracket. I didn't really explain this, but you know, even on the, yeah, I should say this now, that on the gromov witten side, uh, L0 and L minus one, they're kind of closed under bracket. So once you find these two, you don't get any more, you make no profit. And even L1, you get a little SL2. If you get a, if you find L1, it's not enough because when you start taking the bracket, you'll just get more L0s and L minus one, there'll be a little SL2 there. But if you find L2, then, then you, then you uh, win because you can start taking brackets of L2. First, you, you, you find L1, then you take brackets of L1 and L2. You can generate the whole, all the relations. So actually guessing these relations, you really only have to guess one or two of them. So that's, how, that's what happened basically. You could, by using just data and undetermined coefficients with a lot of hope for what you have, with the method under, undetermined coefficients, of course, you have, to, you have to be correct on what terms you allow but that's how we did it, yeah. At the computer. Without the computer, it would have been impossible. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so in the very end, um, if you take stereo powers not on C cross P1, but on some non-trivial vibration in P1, yeah. does it talk something about Hill uh, OS? Sorry, I'm having a difficult time understanding. You're, you're you're somehow too far from the microphone, or it's not. Uh, so I understood so, that we're supposed to look at some different vibrations over P1. Yeah, yeah no, over S. So in the end, you consider. Oh, oh, oh yeah, S. Yeah, I don't think you learn too much about that. I mean, you mean if you want whether that gives you some new information about S. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you should ask Miguel. That's he's thought. He's I think he's thought about those things. In fact, I think I asked him that once. And my memory is the answer is that you don't learn anything else from S about S. But if if Miguel's here, maybe he can say something. Or maybe he's not in in Bure. Anyway, my my memory is that Miguel thought about that, and the answer is you don't learn the thing. Oh, yeah, that's he right. answered it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we have uh, some more questions in the Q&A. Have you thought about some more geometric formulation for the LK operators on the PT side? No, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, meaning somehow having some geometric construction that gives this without me having to define all the terms, right? Yeah, it'd be good if someone could just tell me what this class was. Yeah, go for it. I don't know how to do it, but it's a good... I, I guess that there are some... No, I, maybe I have some ideas about that and the ways that these were formulated, but. Like in the Hilbert scheme case, the, uh, the algebra of derivations um, of the, the cup product was studied in this paper of Georg, where he, uh, where, where he studied this Lie algebra action in the case of K3 surfaces, at least. So maybe there is some hope to connect them with. Yeah, it's a, it's a good direction. I mean, I, I, I think that, I think this is, this is, a, a, a question in the direction of trying to prove the various are constraints within the geometry of uh, sheaves, which, uh, as I said, it's a direction that I'm very happy if someone goes in that. <laughs>
Um, somehow, sometimes I feel that knowing all the Gromov Witten theory uh, makes it harder to to uh, to work on that problem. It's better maybe just to not know anything about curves and try to think about some uh, some structure on the sheaf side. There's another question: Does there exist some blob formula for PT counts? Uh, you know the way the way one, one the way one thinks about blow up formulas, one the way one can think about blow up formulas is, is in terms of degeneration. That it, to 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 find a blow up formula, you need to know. It's it's, it's some kind of universal formula about projective space blown up, and I I don't know I mean I I don't know a closed formula for that, but uh, very but using the degeneration ideas. Uh, you can make some progress in the sense that if you're interested in a particular invariant, you can often get it, but I don't know a general formula. Any other questions? For PT or for the Hilbert scheme, do the Virasor constraints uniquely characterize the descendant series? So um, I don't think so. I would say that, that the answer is no, at least for the, for the, um, yeah, for the stable pairs, you know, you could ask that on Gromov Witten theory. And I think the answer there is also no. It's in the semi simple case, it's yes. So if you ask in the semi simple case, maybe there's, there's a bigger chance. So maybe the answer is yes in the semi simple. If you take a semi simple, if you take a toric uh, threefold, then it, it's, it's a, it is the case that the descendant, that the Virasara constraints on the Gromov Witten side, they, they do characterize it. But you have to use, one piece of additional geometry, which is the topological recursion relations. This is explained in the paper of Gottman. And there's different ways to think about it, but the, the most elementary one is that you use these uh, topological recursion relations. So on the stable pair side, it won't be the case that, yeah, I guess that means it won't be the case that the actual Virasara operators will uniquely determine it. You'll have to think about some replacement for these uh, something that will play the role of those topological recursion relations? It's a good question. But my guess is maybe one could think of some geometry that will play the role there. I don't know what though. But for this, the, the Hilbert scheme of points, I haven't thought at all about it. It's again, something you should ask Miguel. Any other questions? All right, if not, let's, 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 let's again. Thank you.